Well, hello and welcome to the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast. My name is Luke Stamps. I'm on the board of directors at CBR. Uh, and today I'm joined by my colleague uh, here at Anderson University, Dr. Channing Chrysler, uh, who's associate professor of New Testament here. And we'll say more about him in just a minute. Uh, CBR is a group of Orthodox Evangelical Baptists committed to retrieving the great tradition for the renewal of Baptist faith and practice. And if you enjoy what you hear today, we invite you to check out our website at centerforbaptistrenewal.com. You can also follow us at, at Baptist Renewal on, on Twitter and then uh, on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Baptist Renewal. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends. So in today's show, uh, we continue our series on the theological classics reading challenge that we've set out for uh, 2021. Um, and today we come to uh, Martin Luther, uh, the great 16th century uh, German reformer. Um, and there are perhaps many books we could have selected, but, but we chose uh, three writings uh, from 1520 that are, that are published as the, the three treatises. We'll talk about uh, what they each are uh, in just a bit. Uh, but they were published in the, the sort of height of the controversy uh, over Luther's reforms uh, the year before he was excommunicated from the church. Uh, and so we'll say, say more about that. We'll talk about that today and just Luther's theology more generally. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to have uh, Dr. Chrysler on today uh, is because he has a, a deep interest in Luther. Uh, in fact, he just published uh, a book with Rob Plummer, uh, who edited this book with him called Always Reforming Reflections on Martin Luther and Biblical Studies. I believe it was a, a festrift for uh, their professor and my former professor as well, uh, Dr. Mark Seifried. Uh, who taught at Southern Seminary for many years. Um, and so I uh, wanted to have Dr. Chrysler on uh, to talk about uh, some, some Lutheran theology. So what, what better the two Baptist uh, uh, scholars <laughs> sitting around talking about uh, Luther. So anyway, before we begin, uh, Channing, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself to our listeners. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for uh, having me, Luke. And um, I've been here at Anderson for over 10 years now. And um, I'm sort of the New Testament department. There's really not anybody else, um, which is can have some uh, ups and downs with it. But I um, have a wife, Kelly. We've been married for 25 years now and have uh, five children, one of, uh, one of whom is a student here at AU. Um, and so I, I'm, a, I'm a Baptist and a New Testament scholar uh, here to talk about Luther, which is a bit of an odd combination. but. Um, I think some of the experiences in my past have sort of brought me to this point. So yeah. um, it's, always, it's always enjoyable to talk about and sort of step out of your sort of main discipline um, and uh, see what's going on in other places. So, right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I really admire that. Like it's, it's something that, that we talk about a lot um, among the CBR people, just sort of helping to to bring down some of those silos that exist between the different theological disciplines. Um, that's really a modern phenomenon where we, we have uh, such specialization that we sort of don't talk to each other. So biblical studies, not talking to, to systematic theology and, and, and often both disengage from the history of interpretation and history of doctrine. And so uh, I really appreciate this kind of endeavor where you're bringing biblical studies together with the kind of historical theology uh, and I think that really is a fertile ground for reflection. Well, tell us a little bit about how you got interested in Luther. Yeah, I think I think it really stems from sort of two interrelated strands, really. I think one, like a lot of people, Luther's own biography sort of resonated with me, uh, particularly some of the concerns, nagging concerns that he had throughout his life about uh, assurance and his standing before God. And I think as a, as a young person growing up in sort of a typical Baptist church in West Texas, uh, assurance of salvation was oftentimes tied to um, a moment of conversion or walking the aisle or saying a particular prayer. Um, and over time, that kind of assurance uh, really started to wear thin. And so I actually had someone recommend to me that I read uh, Roland Banton's uh, biography of Luther, still, I think, a really great biography. It's uh, dated now, but, you know, titled uh, appropriately, Here I Stand. And um, there were just some sections in there where Benton reflects upon, you know, Luther's struggles with 
with assurance and doubts and how Luther really made his way through those trials by really focusing upon the efficacy of God's promise and the promise of the gospel. Mm. And it was a real simple idea, but just real meaningful uh, to me. So I think that's one of the reasons that I sort of gravitated uh, towards Luther. And then there was a short time where, unfortunately, I had, a, I had some history classes and a few professors who really talked Luther down for, mm. for various reasons. Now, some of them were probably legitimate in terms of pointing out some of the things that Luther had written, particularly um, that some would, you know, sort of label as anti-Semitic, that sort of gave me pause. Um, but then when I met Dr. Seifried, uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, that's the book that's dedicated, uh, it's dedicated to Dr. Seifried. And Seifried was very interesting, you know, here's somebody who had grown up Lutheran and then had a an evangelical conversion and became Baptist and then became uh, such a, a great professor at a Baptist seminary. Um, and then, of course, now he's sort of, he would say, sort of gone back home and, mm -hmm. and has gone back to the Lutheran uh, tradition and teaches at Concordia in St. Louis now. But his influence, especially, um, really even more pushed me towards reading more Luther um, and even thinking about how Luther might have something to offer um, the world of New Testament studies, which is what I found myself, you know, really um, interested in. And so I think those, those are the two main ways I think that I came to have a, uh, an interest and a, um, just a real love really for, mm. for Luther and his writings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah Dr. Seifert was such an interesting um, voice at Southern uh, yeah. when, when yeah. we were all there. Cause I mean, Southern is uh, sort of, uh, you know, more on the reformed side of the Protestant Reformation, we could say, I mean, it's obviously Baptist, but, but influenced by uh, mostly reformed categories. And so to have this Lutheran voice in a Baptist context out there was just really refreshing to me, uh, because it just sort of reminded you that, that um, the, the world of theology and even the world of Protestant theology is broader than just one particular strand. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I took a couple of uh, doctoral seminars with Dr. Seifert, and they, they were the most memorable classes, I think, that I, that I yeah. took uh, in seminary. So what, yeah. what would you say are some of the, the common themes? I mean, you started to, to hint at some of those in, in your answer um, about what got you interested in Luther, but uh, I, know, I know your, your chapter in this, in this book is sort of asking a question about the center of, of Luther's theology, which is kind of notoriously difficult, right, when you talk about the center of biblical theology or the center of a particular thinker. Um, but putting, putting that sort of the high stakes of one single center uh, aside, like what, what would you say are some of the common themes that emerge? If people, maybe they've never read Luther, maybe this is their first exposure to actually reading Luther's works. Like what, yeah. what are they looking, what, what should they be looking for in, in Luther's works? Yeah, you know, I think if, if somebody just has sort of a casual uh, sense of Luther, you probably would think, well, it's justification by faith or something like this. And I mean, that certainly is a dominant theme. And some would even suggest that it's at the center of, of Luther's theology. But I think it's the way that he engages that, um, that, that maybe is something that's not as appreciated maybe by the, the casual viewer. I think you could really sum up Luther's theology probably in three words, and they really have a, a the, the order matters. I think it would be word, uh, faith, and love. And so what you see throughout all of Luther's writings, whether he's you know being antagonistic, which he most often was, um, or whether he's being reflective, I think one of the common motifs is, is just the importance and the efficacy of God's word and the word of promise. Um, you know, that affects his views of baptism, it affects his views of uh, the Lord's Supper, um, it affects his view just of everything. And, uh, and there's some, there's some instances in which he's, he reflects on uh, the, the way that the, the word of promise actually produces faith. Mm. And so, uh, and then that faith is what really frees one um, to, to love, you know, to love others. And so that's why I would say, you might could sum up his theology in those sort of three words in sequence, um, you know, word, faith, and love. But I think that that's just another way of Luther expressing how he viewed justification by faith in many ways, that 
uh, right standing with God comes through this uh, promise of the gospel. The, the promise of the gospel itself produces faith. Uh, Luther uh, oftentimes would refer to Romans 10, 17, you know, the word come, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Um, and then, you know, that is what uh, justifies one before God, but that, uh, but that transformation and that, that right standing with God uh, should then lead to, to love. Mm -hmm. And so I think even if you, if, if you sort of dig down into those three terms and how they sort of, you know, pervade Luther's works, I think it's just Luther finding different ways to talk about justification by faith, uh, not just as a, not just as a doctrine, but really as an experience. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that I would mention about uh, the, the central point of Luther's theology. Luther oftentimes thinks of theology more as experiential wisdom than he does just uh, a doctrine that one holds to. So he, he always tries to, you know, um, qualify his statements by saying, you know, I agree with the, um, with the, with the apostolic creed. I agree with the councils. I'm, I'm within the, param the parameters of orthodoxy, but I want to live this out. It was, was really important for him. And so you mentioned the, the essay that I contributed um, to the book with Rob. Um, it, it was about uh, about the center of Paul's theology and that whole question and the way that it may overlap with the way that we try to think about the center of Luther's theology. And what I suggested in that essay is that um, based on some of the things that Luther writes, that the center of his theology may be um, more along the lines of an experience that consisted of three parts. Um, and that was uh, prayer, uh, suffering, uh, and meditation on scripture, and that it was sort of the, the interplay between those three things again and again and again uh, that really always stood at the heart of what Luther was believing and doing, and that something similar may actually occur with Paul in the book of Acts and, and in his letters. So yeah. those are a few thoughts about, you know, about the center of Luther's theology. So. Yeah, that's really helpful, and there's, there's so much to explore, and, and there's so much debate over Luther, you know, especially, uh, you know, in the, in the modern era, um, the, the Finnish school, you know, uh, emphasizing the more transformative mystical element um, and, you know, kind of a, a more traditional kind of reformed understanding of Luther. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting things to get into when you think about it, it, just interpreting Luther. But I, I think one thing that I, I um, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this theology reading challenge is to just get people in the text themselves right so read it for yourself and uh you start to engage with these these particular writings uh which sort of brings me to the next question like what what would you say um i mean it's voluminous writings obviously uh for luther what what are some that stand out to you what are your favorites what, where would you start um i mean in addition to the ones that we'll talk about maybe top three favorite Luther writings. Yeah, my, my favorites are, are maybe um, a bit offline compared to, you know, some of the main ones. And I think what you're, what you all are, are doing is wonderful. And I think you definitely want to start with the most well-known, the main, uh, the main writings, but I think some of the maybe lesser known is, is actually a really short essay that Luther penned um, as a, as, as an introduction to a collection of his writings later in his life, uh, around 1539, 1540. Uh, you know, always he has students and he has, um, he has colleagues who want to, you know, put his, all of his works and in, in, in bound volumes and put it all out there. And Luther is oftentimes hesitant about that. But finally he realizes they're gonna do it whether he wants them to or not. And so he, figures he better frame it the way he wants it framed. And so he pens this little essay um, that inter introduces his works there in 1539. Uh, and it's sort of what I just um, mentioned. It's a reflection on Psalm 119 mm. and the way that the psalmist uh, sort of did theology. And what he recognizes in Psalm 119, it's that I always tell students, this is that psalm that you can't read if you're trying to work your devotional in in the morning because it's so long, right? And what he notices for the psalmist is that the psalmist does theology by 
uh, again, the uh, the Aratio uh, prayer, meditatio, uh, thinking about uh, scripture, and then tentatio, or Luther even coined a German term on fechtung to talk about this agonizing struggle. And so, in this little essay that he that's you know that's attached to the introduction to his works, um, he just wants to make it clear that this is how you do theology: that you uh, you experience it, that you read God's word. And you cling to the promise of God, but then you go out and live your life and everything seems to threaten it. And so you cry out to God in prayer. And sometimes it's just, it doesn't work in that particular sequence. Um, sometimes it's you struggle and you're driven to prayer, which drives you to the word. I mean, it can just sort of triangulate in a lot of different ways. Um, but it's just a fascinating little essay uh, that I think I've just found really helpful personally, but also for just understanding the way that uh, Luther lived and thought. Um, I, I found that really helpful. And then um, a couple of years ago, I, I started uh, really reading more of uh, these, this correspondence that Luther had, um, these letters sort of, of spiritual consolation that he writes to people. So he'll write to you know um, wives who've just lost their husband or parents who've just lost a child or um, he, he responds to people who have certain, you know, sort of theological questions. And these little letters of spiritual consolation are just really fascinating, again, uh, insights into seeing how um, he, he really put his, uh, all of his learning and his study of scripture and his, his theological reflection, how he really put it to use, mm. um, you know, for the church and for people who were, uh, who, who were hurting. And so, they're they're very short letters oftentimes but i think they just pull together so many uh themes and pieces of luther's life um i just i think they're they're really enjoyable to read so i would encourage i would encourage your your listeners and your viewers to um you know to check those out as well um yeah. and thinking about luther yeah, yeah that's great <clears throat> what about in terms of like um biblical commentaries i mean do you still use those? Are those still beneficial? I know a lot of people have Calvin's commentaries and, and they still get a lot of use. Yeah. Luther's commentary on Galatians, I know, is, is, is kind of well known. What, what would you say in terms of biblical commentary if, if people wanted to grab some? Yeah, I mean, his commentaries on Romans and Galatians, I think, are, you know, they're, they're wonderful. Uh, of course, in my own little uh, world of New Testament scholarship, you know, since Christer Stendhal and the new perspective on Paul, um, you know, uh, to, to quote Luther, um, Luther's commentary in, in an academic setting would oftentimes be frowned upon, um, although I, I think it's a bit hypocritical of those who criticize it. I, I'm thinking of a few works that have recently come out, um, you know, a huge volume on Paul's theology, which is basically uh, the author admits that he's just using the framework of Karl Barth um, to do Pauline mm -hmm. theology. So it's a little bit interesting that it's okay to use Barth, but not not Luther. So mm -hmm. I still think that um, I, I still think that that uh, his commentaries have have a, a great great benefit. Um, but also, I think we sometimes probably uh, don't realize how much Luther wrote on Genesis. Mm -hmm. uh, so his his he he has uh, lots of lectures, uh, commentary. Um, on the book of Genesis, which I always really appreciate because his, uh, his focus and when he reads Genesis is not like it often is for um, folks today, uh, evangelicals, especially today when they read Genesis. I mean, mm -hmm. he's thinking he has a very expansive sort of biblical theological framework um, and the questions he's asking and the way that he's engaging it, um, I just find really refreshing. So, yeah. yeah. When I teach hermeneutics here, um, I, I always quote uh, Luther's commentary on Genesis, uh, his his treatment of allegory, um, because I, I don't know what the, you others in the department think about this, and maybe this, maybe you won't agree with this. I don't know. That's fine. Um, but I, you know, I think a lot of people uh, have the mistaken notion that what Luther and Calvin and the other reformers are doing is something that stands in and stark discontinuity to the kinds of allegorical or figural or 
typological readings that you see in the medieval and patristic eras. Uh, and in that, um, in the, actually in his introduction to the Genesis commentary, he says, no, allegory is fine. <laughs> like it's, it, as, long, as, long as, it, as long as it's, um, uh, as he puts it, like the flowers and the embellishments on the literal sense. So the historical sense has a kind of priority but allegory is permissible uh, under certain conditions, which I think is not normally what we think about when we think about the reformers. We kind of think about them as kind of the first modern interpreters that you know, are just saying, let's just stick to the historical literal sense. Uh, but no, Luther and Calvin as well are willing to do uh, what we might call allegorical or figural interpretation. I don't, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I think I think you're right. It's interesting. Uh, Rob's essay in the the little book that we put together is on Luther and allegory, and um, I think what he really brings out is that. And I think you've you, I think you're representing it the right way. Is that you might you might could use the analogy of a meal. I think for Luther, the literal sense remains sort of the main dish, but allegory is sort of like dessert. And it can have sort of you know this um, which is necessary, right, and good, and <laughs> and can and can help people um, you know better understand the implications of the literal sense of the text, uh, you know, for their own faith and for their own uh, lives. And so, yeah, I think Luther. It's sort of interesting his engagement with allegory. It's sometimes a love hate relationship because mm -hmm. he is sometimes openly. I mean, critical of origin and others, um, but at the same time, he does participate in it to some extent, but I think he sees himself as doing something uh, different, right, than some of his his predecessors, but you're right, he doesn't jettison it altogether. He, yeah. he, he sees some enduring value for it, um, and I, I think that's right. I mean, I hear sermons all the time that are allegorized for the sake of the listener, so mm -hmm. I think whether we're cognizant of it or not, we're still using it to some degree it's probably better to be aware of it, engage it in a way that can be helpful. And I think that's sort of what Luther is encouraging people to do. So. Yeah, you, you kind of have to uh, look at Luther's practice, not so much his polemics, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, because yeah. he's very strong against philosophy and allegory and the fourfold sense and all kinds True. of things yeah. that if you examine his writings closer, well, he's actually, you know, not abandoning those things altogether, right? He's, he's making a rhetorical yeah. point uh, in in contrast to the the abuses we could say of the late medieval Catholic Church, but not necessarily departing from some of those pre modern approaches altogether. Yeah, I mean all those things that you mentioned made Luther who he was as a student. You know, long before his sort of um, his turn to faith, as he might describe it. I mean, it, it it's 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 what framed his epistemology, his learning. I mean, all of those things. Uh, so he could never quite get away from it and oftentimes he he openly embraces it but you're right in his polemics um because of some of the abuses that he sees with it uh you know he he sort of rails against it and so the casual viewer might think oh he's against all these things but many of those things sort of made him who he was um right. yeah so mm, that's good well, let's talk a little bit about the, the three treatises, um, which we had uh, folks read for this reading challenge. So again, these are three, um, I don't know what you'd call them, essays, pamphlets, booklets, they're shorter books um, that Luther writes um, in 1520. So uh, the year that uh, Pope Leo X issued uh, his papal bull threatening him with excommunication. He was excommunicated the next year in 1521 at the Diet of Worms. Uh, so this is, uh, it's maybe not necessarily the best representation of Luther's mature thought. I mean, we, we could go to the, to the, to the catechism, perhaps, uh, to get something that's, that's more representative of his, his mature thought. But I, I do think, that, you know, my favorite of all of his writings is The Freedom of a Christian, uh, which is one of these three. Uh, but so just, just uh, so our listeners know, the, the, the three uh, books that we read this month, um, the freedom, On the Freedom of a Christian, uh, an appeal to the German nobility and the Babylonian captivity of the church, which is, you know, one of the best titles, I think, uh, in Luther's corpus. Um, but I, maybe we could just kind of look at these each uh, in, in their chronologic, chronological order, and you, maybe we could just kind of reflect on some of these themes. Um, so in, in uh, the appeal to the German nobility, um, uh, Luther talks about uh, tearing down what he calls the three walls um, that um, 
that the papacy um, had established. Um, uh, one, the, the, the idea that the, um, that the church has authority over the temporal powers or the spiritual author authorities having uh, um, authority over you know, the kings and magistrates and so on. Uh, two, that the, only the pope, only the magisterium has the authority to interpret scripture rightly. Uh, and then only the Pope has the authority to call a council. So there's really no conciliar check on the Pope's authority. All of that can kind of sound, um, I, I don't know, a little passe maybe from our perspective. Like what, what would you say, is, is this still a relevant work uh, for us to read as we think about uh, those Reformation era debates between Luther and the papacy? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think... Um... Some might suggest that it becomes less and less relevant with each passing year, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because uh, if we if we really believe that we're living in a uh, a post Christian era in the West, um, you know, some of what Luther's doing in addressing the German nobility is he's asking for help from secular authorities to help reform what he sees as a corrupt church, and I think it's it's hard to imagine. A same kind of scenario unfolding today, right? At least, and it's it's very. I think it's hard for us to you know to to imagine that we would go to local authorities because you know the church down the street is just acting up. But then sometimes I think, well, in principle, um, given some of the things that have happened in our own country the last couple of years, um, and and given some of the things that's happened in the Catholic Church, but in all churches in terms of sexual abuse, for example. I think in principle, some of what Luther has to say may very well be relevant, that there are times in which, um, sorry. That's okay. Maybe you should just leave it off. It was more foreboding. That way. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> there's been a good effect there, right? Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I think, I think in some ways, at least in principle, there may be times when you have to call upon secular authorities um, to really correct um, churches that have uh, gone rogue, whether the secular authorities have any kind of inkling of why this is wrong spiritually, right? Mm -hmm. um, they may not have the same sort of theological perspective that you do and know the biblical texts that are sort of driving you to go get their help. Um, but I think at least in principle, you know, I could see some scenarios where, sure, sometimes you have to call upon authorities outside of the church um, you know, to, to help reform it. And those are certainly sad times, but I think they're, they're necessary. So, so while the two circumstances um, may not map onto each other perfectly, I think in that way, there may be an, in principle, uh, you know, something there. Um, and then I think also just within, within Christendom, whatever that may look like for someone, it's always been the case, hasn't it, in church history that pe people uh, gravitate towards power and oftentimes they abuse uh, that power. And I think in principle also here, we could say, look, within your own sort of Christian orbit, there's going to be some power players. Uh, there may come a time and there may be a need to call them to task mm -hmm. and to question their authority. And I think that some of the things that Luther lays out in addressing the German nobility could be applied to those situations. Um, we might not always want to uh, approach it with some, the biting sarcasm that <laughs> Luther uses. I mean, you know, at one point he tells Charles um, in addressing the German nobility, just remember, Charles, we're not dealing with people here. We're dealing with demons, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, we probably want to avoid that kind of thing. But, uh, but I think there in principle as well, there's, there may be times in which you have to question those people who've risen to authority. Um, and you have to sort of undermine the walls that they may put up around themselves to protect themselves from scrutiny and from um, from calling them to task. And so I, I do think there are some things in that sense that are still very applicable, you know, today. Yeah. Another thing that comes out um, in this particular work is um, a, a theme that one one thing that Luther is sort of known for the a kind of two kingdoms theology, seeing the spiritual and the temporal as both legitimate but separate spheres. Um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, what, what's Luther's contribution here? Um, that, that theme of, the, of two kingdoms, of course, 
gets applied in all of different kinds of ways, some more helpful than others, uh, especially as you think about, you mentioned earlier, like Luther's um, tendency towards anti-Semitism uh, in some texts, um, what, you know, whatever we could say about Luther himself on those points, Luther was certainly used by the Third Reich um, in their um, campaign against the Jews, and, and also this two kingdoms theology sort of used to, to justify some pretty terrible things that, that the Nazis were doing. At the same time, as a Baptist, as Baptists, right, we, we come, come at this and say, well, there's something here that Luther himself maybe wasn't quite fully grasping, right, that there is a separation between the temporal and spiritual powers. But what, what would you say along those lines? What, what's Luther's contribution on this two kingdoms theme? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, you, you sort of begin to see um, some of the foundation being laid for, for those two, that two kingdom theology that he, he really expresses more after 1520. Um, but you already, you, you kind of see it, the, the groundwork um, being laid, sort of the wheels already turning in Luther's mind. And I think you're right there. Historically, as history unfolds, there are these I would suggest unintended consequences of this two kingdom idea that Luther uh, talked about. So even with his, you know, um, his works on against the Jews, uh, which, you know, are some of the things I wish he would have never said, uh, and different historians have, you know, sort of theorized as to why he does this or what may have been going on in his life to try to excuse it. The, the reality is, is it can't be excused. But I don't think that his ultimate consequence would have been something that you know, for those kinds of works or ideas to be used for something as you know horrific as what we see um, in the Third Reich or something along those lines. But, but I also sometimes remind students, it's a good reminder of the things that we say, tweet, write can have unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. Somebody can pick it up and use it for, you know, for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. Sometimes I think that's what's happened with um, you know, Luther's two. Uh, you know, sort of this, this two-tiered idea of kingdoms, uh, this temporal and this eternal, this earthly and this heavenly kingdom. I think in some ways, Luther, that idea originates because of, out of a pastor's heart, and he sees um, some of the, the, the things which people are pained by, and I think he sees it as a way of trying to um, help peasants, etc., through a number of, of ordeals. I think his I think his his motivations are oftentimes um, very good, but then again, you have these unintended consequences for how it gets used. I don't know personally. Sometimes when I think about politics, I just want to gravitate towards towards some kind of simplistic understanding of what Luther was talking about, so that I don't have to sort of wed these things or think about these things together. But I think the reality is is that they just bleed into each other. Um, I think that was true in early Christianity. I think that continues to be true today. So sometimes I think it's a, there's some things that Luther has to say about it that are helpful, but I, I wonder ultimately if, it, if it's just not true to life um, mm. in, in terms of what actually happens uh, with, the, you know, with the overlap between these sort of uh, you know, two kingdoms. But I think there's, there's some uh, helpfulness there and just in terms of holding out hope that there's something better, right? If you're, right. if you're dissatisfied with the current political climate, the solution may not be to get your guy in office the next mm. time around. Uh, the solution uh, would very well be that there's a, a greater heavenly eternal kingdom, um, which yeah. we are a part of in Christ. I think that can be a helpful corrective. Uh, to people's sort of political anxiety in the church oftentimes. I think that can be very helpful. Um, but again, as I've mentioned, there's some also some aspects of it that can have some, some unintended consequences that can be, you know, quite negative, that can yeah. be used more like a club and a hammer by governments, um, uh, yeah. you know, to sort of keep people to keep people in order. I right. sometimes think this happens when I hear politicians in North America, for example, using Romans 13 from both mm -hmm. sides, you know. Uh, so this kind of thing I think is, you know, it's going on and it was going on on Luther's day as well, so. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that kind of material is highly relevant, even if we don't follow Luther on every point. Um, just the ref reflection on the, the relationship between the church and the state or, or between the temporal and the eternal um, just keeping in mind the church, the church's identity as the church, as something distinct from 
the temporal powers. Um, again, I think as a Baptist, I think Baptists sort of finally got it right, you know, seeing that there's this separation uh, of the two, both have their legitimate spheres. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot for those of us who are Baptists seeking to retrieve Luther that we can appreciate along those lines. Uh, as we kind of move on then um, to the Babylonian captivity of the church, uh, which is largely a critique of, of uh, transubstantiation and of the, the Roman Catholic understanding of the sacraments more generally. Uh, this is another part I think that is really beneficial for um, Baptist evangelicals more broadly uh, to read Luther, and I would say also the other reformers as well, is just how central the sacraments were for the reformers. I think sometimes those of us who are more Baptist, low church evangelical, we can kind of just uh, try to like take the, 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 the kernel of soteriology uh, at a personal level, justification by faith, and out of sort of out of the husk of this ecclesiology that uh, is it's set within a particular view of the sacraments. Um, so in this, in this book um, on the Babylonian captivity, again, especially thinking about his critique of of the Roman Catholic Mass. Um, he's especially bothered by uh, the fact that the Catholics uh, withhold uh, the, the supper in both kinds. So, so they, they only give the laity um, the, the, the bread and not the wine. Why is that such a big deal to Luther? Yeah, I think, again, it goes to his pastor's heart and imagining that, um, you know, that you would deny the peasant something that the pope and the cardinals freely get mm -hmm. and um luther has this he has this uh th this really push um to see everybody on equal uh footing mm -hmm. um um uh, the priest and the the peasant and uh the pope and everybody uh you know in between i think it's in um uh, I think it's it's in the latter parts actually to, to I don't mean to jump back to go back to the the uh, to addressing the German nobility. One of the things he wants to see an end to is people kissing the Pope's feet, for mm -hmm. example, um, that he, he just feels like that they're that the Pope, he says, should be uh, one who who essentially cries out day and night for the people, uh, not somebody who has his feet kissed by them. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the reasons that he is, you know, taken aback by the fact that certain elements are being denied uh, to, to people is that sense, that sort of larger uh, principle that he held to and this commitment that he had to, to seeing sort of the whole church being on equal footing. Um, and of course, for Luther, uh, and you're right, I mean, transubstantiation plays a huge part in uh, Babylonian captivity. He goes after uh, folks like Aquinas a little bit, uh, and Aquinas is what he Luther views as Aquinas is maybe misunderstanding of some Aristotelian thought when it comes to accidents and etc. I mean, mm -hmm. for Luther, it really came down to this, right? That it was it's not hock, it's hick, it's not that, it's this. So it's not that Jesus's body or blood is somehow in there somewhere, um, but that that actually is it, and. This goes back also to the efficacy of God's word for Luther, um, that when Jesus first said, this is my body, that was enough for Luther, right? That, that in a sense, and he would admit mysteriously, somehow this is, um, this is always the body and this is always the blood from, because Jesus has word has in a way set it apart in that sense. So you didn't need, um, uh, a priest to speak something over it for it to become and you know somehow the body and the blood is somewhere somehow in there somewhere um luther and to, to go back to your original question why was this why does this bother luther so much i think it's because his plain reading of scripture it is why it bothers him right uh when he reads you know luke 22 or those passages when you have the institution of the lord's supper i mean he he pretty much just takes jesus's at as the this word of this is my body this is my blood and and luther takes that in a very plain uh you know literal sense so so to deny the cup is to deny participation participation in um you know in uh in christ in a sense and so i think that's why it becomes um 
uh, so important to them. Yeah. 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 And I think that there's, there's just a lot that, like I said, we have to, to learn from that. Even, even if we don't follow Luther again on every point on this, I mean, I, my own view of the supper tends to be more Calvinian than Lutheran. Um, but uh, in, in either case, they, they were much closer to each other, I think, than, than uh, either of them are to a lot of really low church kind of pure memorialism, yeah. um, which I think is kind of arresting for a lot of people who may have, you know, grown up hearing Luther and Calvin as these great heroes, but at the same time also seeing what we might call higher view of the sacraments as something that was Catholic, you know, uh, not Protestant. And then you come to Luther uh, who teaches some kind of baptismal regeneration as well, and and also some kind of real presence, um, and 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 Calvin a bit different, I think a bit closer to the Baptist tradition, uh, at least in its origins. But anyway, I just think it's 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 helpful. It's it's a helpful corrective for maybe uh, a diminishing of the the role of the sacraments. I mean, and so may, maybe just reflect a little bit on that. Like, what would you say we have to learn about? Um, just in our own spiritualities, like what 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 would we yeah. stand to gain by recovering a, a stronger sense of baptism yeah, I mean, or supper? You know, nothing grates on me more than to hear somebody in a church service, whether it's you know whether you're observing the Lord's Supper or baptism, to hear, you know, let's be clear, this is just symbolic, you know, uh, where we uh, focus so much on what we think these things are not that we forget what they really are, and um, you know. You, I, I very much have been helped by Luther and, and sort of seen uh, these baptism and the Lord's Supper and the church as Christ really is there. Mm. <laughs> you know, uh, that uh, I always sort of go back to Matthew 18, where two or more gather in my name, um, there I am. And so, so he, he's, he's truly there uh, at the supper. He's truly there uh, at, at, the, at the baptism. Um, obviously, I wouldn't go as far as to, to think of it in the same terms that Luther does, but just that just that recognition of Christ's presence in those moments, I think that should be the starting point. That's how we should frame it. Uh, that's how we should um, talk about it, right? That we are yeah. eating this meal with Jesus. Um, right. That Jesus is um, that Jesus is uh, in the waters with us, if you will. Um, mm. And so, I think it, that's that's been helpful both both from uh, bo both from Calvin and Luther. Uh, I, I think that that has, and, and I think you're exactly right. We we don't want to think maybe Baptists who use the reformers or who use Luther want to sort of leave that element out of it. But I think it's I think there's something to be gained there. Yeah. Um, and so I, I have found it very helpful. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, I, I often quote this line from Mill, Millard Erickson, the Baptist theologian, who says that for many Baptists, uh, we we don't believe in the real presence, but the real absence of Jesus <laughs> in the summer. Yeah, so that right. is if yeah. the only place in all of creation where Christ is not is in this meal <laughs> that we take together. Yeah, yeah that's uh, right. And I mean, that's kind of a, a lampooning of the view. But I mean, for a lot of people, right, like you're saying, like they, they, we tend to say more of what it's not than what it is. And yeah. even if even if you hold to something that's closer to memorialism, uh, as I've said elsewhere, like you you can hold to a a robust memorialism, you know that that at yeah. least still sees it as a means of grace to strengthen and confirm our faith. So yeah. lots to learn there. Well, let's move on then to the uh, freedom of a Christian, which, as I mentioned earlier, is kind of my favorite uh, of of Luther's work. So many stirring uh, passages. In fact, I just wanted to read one. I uh grabbed a, a, one of my favorite quotes from this and maybe you can share some of your own uh favorite parts of this book but uh th I, this 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 uh passage has always been really um arresting to me who can understand the riches of the glory of this grace here this rich and divine bridegroom christ marries this poor wicked harlot redeems her from all her evil and adorns her with all his goodness her sins cannot now destroy her since they are laid upon Christ and swallowed up by him. And she has that righteousness in Christ, her husband, of which she may boast as of her own and which she can confidently display alongside her sins in the face of death and hell and say, if I have sinned, yet my Christ in whom I believe has not sinned and all his is mine and all mine is his. So it's this, this beautiful description of union with Christ uh, through this marital analogy, 
uh, this glorious exchange of, of, of all, all, you know, we share, Christ shares uh, in us by taking our sins, we share in him by uh, receiving uh, the gift of his righteousness and, and eternal life. So anyway, that, that's always just been just a punch in the mouth for me. Just love, love the, the encouragement uh, that that brings. But what, what about you? What, what stands out to you uh, in the freedom of a Christian? What, what, what would you say about this, this last of the yeah. three treatises? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing that strikes me is that this is Luther at his calmest. Mm. Um, and because originally um, the freedom of a Christian w- was attached to a letter that he wrote to Pope Leo X. It was a conciliatory letter. He was actually apologizing just a bit when you actually go back and read that letter. Mm-hmm. But in the publishing process, those two things got separated. Um, but I think it sort of helps Luther be a little more balanced. He's not as caustic. He's not as sarcastic, which don't get me wrong. I, sometimes I love those things about Luther. But it's really nice to see him where he's just sort of trying to lovingly, calmly um, really articulate what he believes. Mm-hmm. and. So I think that's one thing that I always am reminded when I when I when I read it. And then of course you have that sort of jarring paradox right off the bat where, you know, we're we're free from everything in Christ and yet we're enslaved to all in Christ. Mm. And so this um very much sort of I think articulates how Luther sees the he sees the Christian experience and he very much sees these things as uh sort of informing one another and fueling one another. Uh, in a in a real sense, although he's very particular about the the order, right, and not getting that cart before the horse. That uh, that again, as I t- talked about earlier, if you were to sum up Luther's theology in three words, it would be word, faith, and love in that order. And so I think you that's kind of reflected in uh, in and on Christian liberty. And I, I would agree his analogy of um, of 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 marriage. He also says in that same section, he talks about faith as the wedding ring of faith. Mm. And uh, I'm always looking for ways to talk to students or even my own children about faith. And I think that that's a, it's a really helpful analogy, right? Uh, the, of, of bringing uh, two people together and that, uh, that faith is this reminder that this is how I have what, what is Christ, right? This, mm. this ring that he gave me, uh, that's what that's how I know that that I am his and he's mine. Um, so that it, it never uh, sort of leans upon uh, works, right? That I didn't merit anything uh, for, for Christ to give me all that he is and for him to take on all that I am. And I also, uh, uh, even in the, the little portion that you just read, uh, here is Luther using uh, Song of Solomon, yes? Uh, uh, in which he, he loves that phrase mm-hmm. uh, from, from that Old Testament book of, you know, uh, uh, I am yours and, and you are mine. Uh, he, he, he speaks about Christ and the believer and the church. He, he oftentimes uses that. And that's kind of peppered throughout uh, on Christian uh, liberty as, as well. So, um, yeah, I, those are some of the things that come to mind when I think about that, that work. So, yeah. you know. and I, I also like just this idea of like the, one thing that sort of impresses impresses me too is just this insistence that it's not our spiritual disciplines that save us even yeah. though they can have i mean he admits that they can have benefit you know um but yeah. but it's christ right it, you're starting to get a sense of that two kinds of righteousness right that he yeah. writes about later yeah. um that you have this righteousness in christ and of course there's a righteousness that that he works in in you as well um but we we have to make this kind of distinction that it's not it's not all of our um, diligence and doing, you know, the good things that we might, you know, think we should do as Christians, reading our Bible, praying, attending church and whatever that yeah. saves us. That's not our assurance, uh, the ground of our assurance. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that old um, Luther movie, uh, the black and white one. Um, have you ever seen that? The, I, the I, I, I have seen that one years ago, yeah. and then I think I traded it in for the, the, the more current uh one yeah. the early 2000s but yeah. yeah i i always show when i teach church history there's a clip from it um from the older one where uh uh i can't recall who luther is dialoguing with but one of the one of the roman catholics and and they say you know uh you know what what will you give people if you've stripped away all of these all of these relics and all of these ceremonies and all of these rituals what will you give in, in their place and Luther says, 
Christ. <laughs> you know, it's like this, this powerful like moment, yeah. uh, just dramatic. Yeah. Of course, that's what we have. Our righteousness is Christ. It's not all the good stuff that we do. Yeah, that's right. Well, just as we uh, close up here, um, what what would you say are some benefits that that Baptists? I mean, this is a podcast for for largely Baptists. Others listen in, but what are some benefits that Baptists? ministers, Baptist Christians can learn from Luther? Anything that we haven't covered uh, that you just want to highlight? Yeah, I, I, I think one of the biggest things that stands out to me that we could learn from Luther and maybe even some Lutherans today, what Baptists could learn, is that I think Luther's uh, reading of the Bible, his theology, um, his preaching definitely is all it all has a Christological framework. Mm. I mean, it's so uh, it's so framed by Christ. I think when you would go to hear Luther, if someone were to ask you what the sermon was about, the answer would have always been the same. It was about Christ. Mm. And sometimes I wonder, and I don't mean to be, you know, I don't want to be the stereotypical critic of the Baptist church, but I can only speak from maybe my own experience and what I've witnessed or sort of seen from a distance. I think oftentimes, too often, Baptist preaching um, is more framed by maybe sanctification mm. um, or these or or Christ likeness um, or these are the things that you should be doing, whether it's share the gospel or um, I mean, they're all good things. Don't get me wrong. But I just wonder if that frame is too big. Um, and that the real frame of all of it, uh, or the center of it, or whatever sort of geometric conception you want to use, um, is is just Christ, Christ crucified and risen through and through. Um, you know, sometimes I, in my earlier years in seminary years, you know, when you think that you just know everything, I can remember going to churches. Um, and just, um, I actually had a professor recommend that I do this. Just count how many times somebody talks about Jesus as compared to how many times the pastor talks about what you should do. Mm. And it always, it was always um, just weighted in the other direction. It was always about what one should do. And so rarely about the person uh, and work of Christ. And I think for, for Luther, that is just shot through all of his thought it's the only way that he could communicate and think um, that sounds very, very elementary and simplistic, but it really was always about Jesus. Mm. And I think that um, as Baptist, I think that's who we want to be. I just think in practice, we may need to work harder at that actually being what frames our preaching, our teaching, our theology, our thought. And I think Luther can, is a good model of that. Yeah, that's really helpful. I, I, that's one thing I, always come away with when I read Luther and, and Lutherans uh, who, who have been influenced by him is just this sense of the objectivity of the gospel. And it's almost, almost like in a disturbing way, right? Because we're so hardwired, uh, you know, as evangelicals, those who've been influenced by Puritanism and pietism and revivalism, all good things. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to yeah. criticize any of those parts of our evangelical identity, but we're so hardwired to think, as you said, like in terms of what, what do I need to do, you know, to improve myself, right, to grow in, in, in my spiritual life. Yeah. And there's just this sense of, of resting in Christ and the objectivity of the gospel that comes through with Luther that I think is a good antidote to just to come full circle to, to the way you described uh, your initial interest in Luther, a, a good antidote to the kinds of anxieties and, and lack of assurance that we often have as we think about our own salvation so anyway thanks so much Channing for being on uh with us it's great to have you yeah thanks for having me uh, just a reminder the book here is always reforming uh, reflections on martin luther and, and biblical studies it's with lexham press uh edited by Channing and and uh, rob Plummer. so uh, i'll close as we always do here uh with the grace and now may the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all this day and evermore Amen.